Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I do keep it uh, 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 muted for the most part, uh, but there are two choices. One is I already have some questions you have at the end. Two, there is a chat function. So if you have questions that come up during the time and you don't want to forget it, put it into the chat, and I promise you I'll try to get to it later. Sometimes I have to stop to let certain people into the waiting room that show up late. That may be the only reason I have to stop. Next, I've given parts of this talk at different times to different folks. Um, there is a lot of material. Don't get blown away. It will come at you a little bit fast. You got to buckle your seatbelt and hang in there. Um, do not hesitate to write down on pieces of paper little things that you pick up because it can really help you to try to remember everything you're going to hear. So I'm going to try to get you through it. Uh, the talk takes about an hour. Uh, so I just want to warn you that you're, you're going to be in that for a little bit of time um, to try to get as much information at you as I can. Okay, uh, so here we go. Um, uh, there's a disclaimer that uh, you did not hear what you thought you heard. That's to protect me. Uh, this is acknowledgments of the, some of the people I worked with and some people I write the uh, magazines for. Uh, I also work very hard for my family. This is uh, three of my boys. Um, and whenever I give a lecture, uh, especially because there is another a colleague of position on the phone, I also have to give uh, financial conflicts of interest. So I'm going to show you some of the books I've written for the American Medical Association. And as an editor, I get royalties. Um, some topics may come up that overlap in these books. And so if somebody were to go buy the books and say, oh, you didn't warn me that you get a little bit of money from that. Uh, but, you know, trust me, me and my co-editors, we get uh, less than a uh, dollar book that's sold, so it's it's not much money. Um, the uh, uh, workability and return to work book does have some implications of what we do when people are at work. Uh, the guide sixth edition is a book that actually looks at how you evaluate people with impairment and disabilities. Uh, this is an, a book on disability benefit systems, which some people find particularly helpful if they're new to the world of uh, what does it mean to have disability, short term, long term, and those other practical uh, issues that come up in life. Uh, what's the agenda for today? So this is the overview of some of the things I'm going to try to hit upon the highlights uh, to let you see what's coming at you, to let you know what we're going to try to cover. I'm not going to cover absolutely everything uh, because there's uh, so much to go over and some things I don't think are applicable to you. More of the medical stuff that has to do with hospitalizations and sick people, right? Um, also, this is the national guideline that I helped write. Uh, we're now working on the next edition of our, our national guideline. So this next edition of the national guideline will be coming out probably, I would guess, in the next week or two, just before the end of the year. We're hoping that's the last edition of our national guideline, that we'll have enough information put out there, enough summarized, that all we need to do is now, you know, wait it out, wait through the vaccines, wait through some herd immunity, and we'll get there, right? Um, also uh, published in our literature is uh, some of the different uh, guides newsletters um, and some of the papers that were published uh, in some of the medical research areas. Again, I'm not going to talk too much about some of those things, less applicable to you. Okay, here we go. Brief history. Epidemic. An outbreak that spreads quickly. A pandemic, which we're in right now, is the one that goes across different countries, right? So people have heard of other epidemics before, Ebola. They've also heard of pandemics before. So those are some of the terms that get thrown around when people talk about pandemics. So you would see some of the bugs that have been associated with that, right? The cholera, the typhus, right? So we've seen pandemics before in history, right? This one obviously creates a lot of unique opportunities and unique perspectives. So this is a busy slide. I just want to show it to you, give you an idea. The green side, bacteria. The blue side, viruses, right? To try to give you an idea of some of the differences between those two, right? Because people say there's an infection, yes. There are infections, but there's different kinds of infections, right? So the bacteria, uh, you don't need a host, right? Viruses always require a host. They have to be inside because they're not considered living organisms. They're considered little pieces of protein, little pieces of material that seem to perpetuate themselves despite not having all those protections, right? And so there's different examples of those. So when people say, well, I got food poisoning, all right? Well, some of that, could be a bacteria, and some of that could be a virus, right? And they behave slightly differently. And this one obviously is a different viral entity, right? Okay, why does it matter? 
It matters because when you start thinking about sizes, you start to get an idea. When you start here way down at the viruses, right? See how tiny these things are? And then you gotta go up a whole bunch of steps, hundredfolds, thousandfolds, to even get to the size of red blood cell or bacteria, right? Human cells way up here. So it lets you know how small the condition we're dealing with. And we also know that they are treated differently, right? So when patients come to see me in the office and say, okay, I got a cold, all right? So most colds are due to viruses. That is why we don't use antibiotics. You wanna try to avoid antibiotics whenever possible because antibiotics have side effects. If you use them too often, you can get resistance and viruses don't respond to antibiotics, right? Bacteria, those do respond, right? And that's the difference to try to keep in mind, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus, right? So there was an original SARS and it's the largest RNA virus. Now look, 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 it's very important, very important here. The largest antivirus known to infect humans, 10 to 30% of the common colds are due to coronavirus, which means at some point, you've already been exposed to coronavirus. By sheer statistics, everybody at some point in life has had a coronavirus infection. Now, most of them are mild little colds. Sometimes you don't realize much, just a sniffle, but we've seen this before. And uh, the four types that we get as little kids keep circulating. These are the four types that never cause any significant illness. So therefore, therefore, the majority of the coronaviruses don't cause severe infections, right? It's called corona because it looks like the sun. And this word SARS stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome. There was a related cause in the MERS, right? And that is something that was also seen in the past that we draw us a little bit of information from, okay? Now, what's the history here, okay? So they jump from horseshoe bats. Now, those bats are not endemic to Wuhan, uh, though they may have come out of the biomedical research lab or through an intermediate uh, animal host. You know, again, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get the true story out of all that stuff, but this is kind of the timeline of some of the people uh, that were uh, trying to uh, notify us when they're trying to notify us. And then eventually, you know, this became more generally known over time, right? Um, bats are mammals. Bats live 25 years. They live in large groups. So that's why the bats tend to be a very common group for us to get stuff from because they are mammals like us. They live a very long time. They live in groups. And so this perpetuates a lot. And there were already research papers that said there is going to be an outbreak one day from this particular problem, okay? So the original SARS outbreak, 0304, lasted nine months, about 8,000 infections about a 10% mortality. Now, I want you to keep that number in mind, 10% more, keep that in mind, right? Also MERS, right? Let's take a look at MERS. MERS, which is a related cousin, had a mortality 35 to 40%, right? So look at those numbers, remember those numbers, because we're gonna be talking about the troubles with SARS-CoV-2, and I want you to keep that perspective going, okay? Uh, and why do we call it COVID-19? Because that's the, the year of the outbreak, okay? No, no, nothing fancier than that, okay? Okay, now, question, is reinfection possible, right? One of the questions you guys have, one of the questions that we see all the time, yes. Uh, but no human reinfection has been confirmed with the same virus. Okay, now, now stay with me on this very important topics here. Very important, ready? One, we already know from the other coronaviruses that they circulate. We get them again and again, right? So we already know that from the common cold. The majority of these are nothing. Number two, there have been about four case reports now, uh, Hong Kong, Nevada, Belgium, um, and uh, one in Ecuador. They said, okay, we perfectly have an example. Somebody who had the infection, documented infection, cleared the infection, later on did. Okay, this is four people out of 25 million in the world, right? So does reinfection happen? Yes, it probably happens. How often does it happen? Almost never. And in these particular examples, they went or traveled to a different area and got a different type of virus. Now, some of them were milder. So it's not always the case that you're gonna pick one up and then it's gonna be another bad situation. If anything, what the science tells us is that if you've had this infection once and then you're exposed to this infection a second time, it's more likely 
that your immune system is going to react to it and protect you. So yes, reinfection, anything is possible. It's rare. It can happen. Now, why does it happen? Well, look, 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 look. Look at this. Influenza. Influenza, the flu, this mutates 50 times a year. That's why we give a flu shot every year because there's these properties called antigenic drift, antigenic shift, where it mutates. Now, not all are bad, right? But that's why every year we give a new flu shot to try to cover this a little bit better. But some years you'll hear, you'll read that the flu shot is the same one as the year before. Corona does not seem to mutate quite as quickly, right? So that's why if you're given a shot or you get the infection, we would expect you're going to have longer lasting immunity, right? Um, so that's why we think that the vaccine might be of some uh, important help to us, right? Okay, next. Here's another uh, micrograph of what they look like, the little blue circles. Here's a model of what they look like, right? And here's one other model. I wanted to show you a few things here. Now, I see this E protein, S protein, M protein. Now, all I want you to keep in mind is these are the parts on the surface that we use for testing, that we use for vaccine development, right? Because we're trying to get the body to see some of these proteins before you get the real infection and to react to those proteins, right? And so that's what's used to try to develop it. Okay, rest stop. We're done with virology. Uh, this is social distancing then and now. And what we're going to talk about now is epidemiology. Now, don't say, oh, my God, Mark, what are you, what are you covering? Stuff like don't worry. I'm going to walk you through it just to try to help you with this stuff. Okay, so here we go. How is this spread? This is spread primarily by respiratory droplets from a cough sneeze. Now, these droplets are large and heavy, right? They usually only travel two to three feet. Everybody says, well, wait, wait, wait. I heard there's a six feet. Everybody says six feet, right? Well, they yes, they say that. But the truth is, it only goes about two to three feet, right? And the next thing is, if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics or the World Health Organization, they said, look, if you're a distance of a meter, you're fine, which is about three feet, right? So don't freak out if you get less than six feet, right? You really have to be in close proximity. You really have to be without masks. There really has to be a lot of uh, opportunity there, right? The droplets that are greater than 100 microns are called ballistic, and some will call them inhaled aerosols, right? That's the way that this gets around, through the large, wet droplets. Now, you're going to hear discussion about aerosols, right? Say, oh, I heard that if you cough, it can go up in the air and can travel for miles or can travel for feet and meters and all that kind of stuff, right? Look, there's a couple examples, right, that we have seen. The Skag Acquire was one. The Chinese restaurant in Guangzhou was another, where they said, look, you have people sitting right next to each other in a small room, and particularly with the choirs or groups, they're singing out loud together without masks, okay? So then it's certainly possible that you could have a very, very, very fine aerosol mist that goes around and you could transmit. But for the vast majority of people, that is not what's happening. This only happens in medical procedure rooms, right? You have to get into a room that is closed, no ventilation, right? Lots of people not wearing masks in order to get into any kind of trouble, right? Otherwise, if you're in very large rooms, if you're in shopping malls, if you're in big stores, right? If you're in a, in a relatively modern building, right? You're fine. If you're working outdoors, if you have windows open, right? The vast majority of these things are enough to protect you, right? It's only when you're in really cramped small quarters without protection, that's a little bit more of a risk, right? Again, so the vast majority is not aerosols, right? It is really through those heavy coughed up and sneezed droplets, right? And uh, there was one, uh, a sorry, a couple studies about some a transmission through toilet systems in very tall apartment buildings. Again, this was in China, not applicable to us, right? However, let's take examples, right? What does go by aerosols? Okay, measles, right? So how many people remember or heard about when they used to have measles parties, right? Or chicken box parties? They say, right, okay, we're gonna get the kids together, let them get it so they can get over with it, right? And all you have to do is be in the room because the measles goes in the air, right? So the attack right there 
85 to 90%. Corona is at most 10% in healthcare workers. So these are people day in and day out working with Corona patients and only about 10% of them pick it up. Why? Because it's not by aerosol, right? And, and in the household, okay, now you're living and working with somebody, you're together with somebody, some of that, okay, how often? 10, maybe 40%, all the time. I see it with my patients, I have people say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know this person sleeping next to his wife and he got sick and she didn't get sick at all. How is that possible? It's possible because it doesn't usually travel by aerosol. It travels by heavy droplets, right? Next, look at these numbers, remember these numbers, right? There's no transmission if the infected person was sick for at least six days, maximum 10 days, rarely 14. In other words, you'd have to have somebody very, very ill that could potentially transmit this after 14 days, okay? By day eight, you are generally done, okay? So now people say, wait, 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 wait. I heard about all these things about, you know, you got to quarantine forever, you got to 14 days and all that kind of stuff. Okay, first of all, even the CDC has now said, no, seven, 10 days at most is all you really need, right? Two, right? You can always have people where they say, well, I know somebody that was sick and they went, got tested weeks later and they still had the virus, right? The test was still positive. Okay, we're gonna get to testing. But what I want you to keep in mind is the following. It's very important, right? When these people go and get tested weeks later, they are not being tested for live virus any longer. They're being tested and they see viral particles, but these are not in sufficient quantities to be transmitted. They're not necessarily active anymore. And so it's not giving you the information you need to know. This information you need to know. If an infected person is sick, at least six days, maybe 10, and very, very rare, if they're very severely ill, maybe they could transmit for up to 14 days, but that's extremely rare. For the vast majority, it's not gonna be the case, okay? Now, look at this, look, look, look. When I told you about those large droplets, right? Under micrograms, they fall to the floor in three seconds. Do you understand? The number one way that this gets transmitted with large droplets, it falls to the floor within three seconds because it's wet and heavy, right? So we say, oh my God, I was, uh, that guy just coughed in this room. We gotta go sterilize the home. Look, by the time you walk in there, it's gone, right? It's down on the floor, right? Little tiny particles, yes, they can be suspended for a long time, but those little particles dry out fast. They don't carry viruses very well, right? And so that's why it's not an aerosol. It's a droplet by the vast majority, right? Look at this. One SARS study showed that the virus is gone at six minutes in sun exposure, right? I say this all the time. When patients say, well, you know, I don't feel good. Get outside. You got to get outside. And all the stuff about wearing a mask outside, this is nonsense, right? Like absolute nonsense. There is almost no chance that you're gonna be walking down the street, somebody's gonna come along and you're gonna pass by them and that's it, you get the infection. There is virtually no, they have to turn their head, face you, cough at you right at the right minute to do all those things. Otherwise, forget about it. The outdoors is your friend. The UV light kills the virus. It gets you into a good mood. It helps with your exercise. It helps with your circadian rhythm. It helps with your sleep. It helps decrease the anxiety or stress that people feel about things. Get outside, get outside and exercise you will be much better off, right? Not, when there's been studies done looking at viruses, right? No study has ever been able to culture viruses from the air, right? So what that means is when people say, yeah, but I heard this stuff floats around or something like that. Look, anything is possible in floating around the world. But the question is, is it transmitting? No, it's not. It's not going to do that. There's no way that it does it, right? Okay, next. There are ways that we've had for decades, right? So this is the original Fort Dietrich 1966 Gesundheit Chamber, right? Where they actually measure cost. They actually measure what comes out. They can know how far things go and how far things travel, right? So you're gonna see one of these pictures. This has been in some literature about how far these things can go. Hey, okay, look, this is an example where things can get really out of hand, right? Where they're talking about, okay, somebody leans back and, and out goes this huge cloud of droplets. First of all, 
notice at the left side, the heavy stuff is all falling fast, like I told you, right? All this aerosol stuff disperses quickly, very unlikely to transmit any particular trouble for you at all, right? Now, incubation period, right? Keep these numbers in mind. The incubation period is four to six days, rarely 10 to 14 days, which is why they're dropping the quarantines from 14 days to seven to 10 days because the incubation period is about four to six days. So if you have a contact with someone, this, the clock starts ticking on the day of your contact. If you get to six days and you don't have any symptoms, you're either gonna be asymptomatic or you just didn't get it, right? And look at this, look, 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 look at this number here, look, look, look. 97.5% of patients are nasopharyngeal positive by nine days, okay? Which means that if you get up to a six day, definitely a week, you are already 80, 90% certain that you didn't get it, right? And virus shedding, this is another print, very important. Virus shedding occurs 24 to 30 hours before symptom onset. Keep that in mind, keep that number in mind. Before anybody even feels anything, they're already shedding virus, right? And the mild cases, they maybe could shed up to seven to 12 days, and the spare cases up to 20 days, but remember what I told you, even if they're shedding virus, even if it goes on longer, they're not necessarily transmitting live virus anymore, right? Uh, and usually viral shedding stops, usually no more than three days after last symptoms, but virus could, detection could go up for six to eight weeks. That's what I told you. You can find virus, right? Which is why I'm always pushing back up against people saying, well, I gotta go get a test, I gotta go get a test. Look, the testing is important, it's helpful, but it can be misleading, right? All these things require interpretation, right? Uh, the majority of people have no mild symptoms, 70, 80%, right? The virus can shed but not be infectious. By the way, they talk about the PCR, which is the gold standard, good test, like it, right? But you have to know that there's even techniques within the PCR called the threshold cycle. And depending on that, it may be positive, but it's not really a true positive because of the way the test is done, right? Um, and by the way, there's no difference in the level of virus between those who are symptomatic and those who are severe, right? And then the NBA has taught us that uh, there could be a three-day proliferative phase, which means, which means that you go 24 to 48 hours before symptoms to a day or two after symptoms as the biggest period of time of viral production, right? We know that from some of the NBA studies, right? So here's another way to look at it. Look at this slide. Look, 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 look. This is a way to think about it, right? You have some contact, right? So you start your incubation, then after, on average, you know, four to six days, so let's put it at five, you get your symptoms, that goes on. Okay, if somebody gets symptoms, they're gonna get it for, you know, maybe a week or a little bit more, and then you start to have the resolution, right? And in transmission, right? How you can transmit to people, okay? So like I said, at first, it's building up your systems, you can't transmit, right? But then even before you get symptoms, there's a period of time where you can transmit it, and then that'll last over until some point in resolution. Again, look at the studies overall, probably about six days and you're done, right? Okay, virus on surfaces, okay? So there's a lot of people talking about this, right? I said, wait a wait, minute, I heard people wiping their groceries and wiping things down and wiping all this stuff, okay? Look, the vast majority of the stuff does not last long on any surface, right? Uh, in general, it, if you have different ways that they test it, you can see, okay, maybe you can have some live virus class for one to two days on that kind of stuff. But let's take a look, 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 look. So here it goes, a busy slide, so stay with me, stay with me, okay? So this is aerosol, right? And this is CoV-1, CoV-2, right? So the original SARS in 0304 and the new SARS, right, from 19, right? And look at this, copper, cardboard, stainless steel pipe. Look at these drop-offs over hours, right? So when you're saying, well, uh, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about all the things that wiped out? Look, you have to envision where somebody who's actively sick or about to get sick is doing your Amazon delivery. You have to envision that they take their mask off and they hack and cough all over the box. You have to then envision that you go out and pick up the box with all the stuff on your hands, right? And then you have to envision that you're gonna take your hands and wipe it all over your face after you get a box delivery, right? It's not going to happen, right? The stuff dies out too quick. 
People are protected. People are washing their hands. You're washing your hands, right? Deliveries, groceries, all stuff does not need to be wiped down, right? Okay, contagiousness, right? All right, so this is an important concept. What it says is, if you do nothing, if you don't socially distance, don't you mask, the COVID-19 on average will infect two to three people, right? By comparison, look at this, measles, greater than 10, right? We already talked about that, right? I said, you put people in a, co uh, in a measles room, boy, it jumps easily, right? Influenza, and it affects about 1.3. It's okay, you say, okay. So this one's a little bit better at infecting people. But when you start mitigating, when you start social distancing, wearing masks, all those kind of things, then the reproduction rate starts falling and that will end this, right? So something called herd immunity, you may have heard of that. And there's a formula for it. The larger the r now, the more the population has to be infected to achieve immunity, okay? So it's an inverse formula, which means, which means that depending on how you look at the data and how you look at the people, you'll often hear they say, oh, you have to have 60, 70% of the population to have this infection in order to get it stopped. Well, there's multiple issues there. First of all, people travel or live in different groups, and also, and also, people change their behaviors, and also, there's a lot of people that have had the infection and don't know it, so they're already immune. And then there's also this blunt in the curve issue, which maybe, possibly, has extended this longer than would have had if we just let everybody kind of have it who's a relatively young and healthy, right? So it very much depends, but on some projections, we could have as little as 15% of people. And by the way, by the way, yes, there was a, well, Mark, I hear all these numbers are going up everywhere. Okay, first of all, it depends where you are, what you're talking about, what the numbers are you're referencing, but in some areas, that's not the case, right? They're citing national data, and, and so what they're, what they're doing is they're, they're putting numbers together which don't always match up together, right? Why are these predictions a problem, okay? So first of all, the Imperial College Ferguson's work, they were the original ones that said, you know, we're gonna have, you know, all these uh, deaths and all this stuff. We have not got near the numbers that they predicted. Why, right? Well, these people have been wrong before. Do you remember mad cow disease? They said, okay, we're gonna have cows infected and they're all gonna die, right? We have to call her, it's never happened. Why? Because individuals vary in their susceptibility. Individuals vary in their propensity to infect others, right? Next. A lot of their data was based on nursing homes, right? And it's still true. The elderly, frail population is the risk group. The rest of us, thank God, are at very low risk, right? If you want to look at any modeling, I recommend the Reich Lab, or where they do some different prediction models can be helpful, right? But I just want to highlight this a little bit more because very, very important concepts. You understand why all these predictions and all the media sometimes distorts this stuff or takes it out of context, right? So look over, look at this. Here's one study, just one study. I know this looks busy, but I'm gonna explain it to you. Just stay with me, okay, right? So here you go. What this study says, okay, look. Uh, when a place reaches one death per million, we're gonna take a look at how quickly that shut down. Well, you'd say. So if somebody has um, one death per million and you shut down fast, then their cases should be low. But if you don't shut down and close the economy and close all the stores, their cases will be high. But that's not the case, right? Look at this. If this was the case, the line would be going up and to the right, right? But it's not the case. A lot of places shut down quickly and had a lot more cases. And places that did not shut down for periods of time had less cases, right? Everybody talks about Sweden, right? So you can see that there's not a good correlation. You're saying, well, wait, 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 why did they shut down the whole world, right? Well, okay, people press panic, right? People press fear. But shutting down an entire economy does not work, right? It doesn't change the trajectories in a significant fashion, right? Um, here's another way to look at this, right? This is the data of the new infections as a percentage, right? And how that varies over time, right? And again, you see that some of these numbers can vary and go down over time, even when they say, uh, okay, well, it should be uh, an exponential growth, right? Um, and there's no evidence from that impact that'll do that, right? Remember about these shutdowns, right? The curves for influenza, the curves for all these things are the same. It goes up, it goes down. You can have an impact, you can bump the curve, but it comes at a cost. And you guys know this better than most, right? The cost of shutting down 
The medical literature, we have that in the return to work book, is overwhelming. It increases mortality, drug abuse, violence, depression, divorce, use of firearms. Everything gets worse. Every health indicator gets worse, right? So to shut down everything is not the way to go. That's not going to help us, right? What's going to help us is using wise decisions, okay? All right, so rest down, right? Next, what we're going to do, we're going to hit upon clinical features, right? So this is going to be more familiar to you because you do work in a clinical environment, right? So let's go. Let's go through this, right? Here we go. Clinical features. Okay, look, if you're over 65, that counts for 80% of the deaths. The median age is 80. If you're over 65 in good health, you have a 90% chance you'll have no or mild symptoms. Now look at those numbers, right? You never hear that stuff, but that's the facts, right? And this is in the higher risk groups, right? Who's at risk, right? Men, uh, in most of the studies, uh, homeless, uh, nursing facilities with that elderly, we talked about that, right? That group, right? If they have hypertension, obesity, diabetes, some of these other things, then they're more likely, right? But when you're dealing with young people, the risks are very small, right? Very small, because this is more of a concern of, of the uh, mortality in the elderly, okay? What do people get? So look, here's a list of some of the different symptoms that people will present with, right? So this can vary uh, depending on what you're looking at and which uh, group you're looking at. So there's all kinds of things that people can have. What people talk a lot about is the fever, uh, the loss of smell, uh, I've had a lot of patients with the sleep disturbance, right? But you can get all kinds of different symptoms, not just the classic they say, oh, this is clearly, um, you know, coronavirus, because it can vary, right? And there are complications. Look, 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 look. I know it's a busy table, busy, right? But this gives you an idea. These are some of the complications that people will get, right? Look at this. There's some complications where people can have clotting troubles, right? Um, uh, there's no question that people can have uh, problems complications for outcomes. I'm not denying, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. What I'm saying is that for the vast majority of people, right, the odds are very much in your favor of mild troubles that you'll clear easily by far, right? You are more likely to have trouble driving in your car and getting killed in a car accident than you are with any of this, right? By far, it's not even close, right? Right. Clinical features. So people talk about different stages, right? They talk about asymptomatics, the mild, pre-symptomatic, meaning before you get it, the mild upper respiratory, the lower respiratory, which is getting down in the lungs, and then AADR is okay. Now that's the bad one, right? That's the rare one, but that's the one we were about, okay? So pneumonia is generally viral, right? It's not treated by an antibiotics. Now people say, well, Mark, I heard when I first got this, that people were using antibiotics and they got better, okay? There's multiple issues there. First of all, a lot of those were case reports. They were not randomized controlled trials. We have no idea. Two. Some of these people, two to maybe 20% were co-infected. They didn't have just corona. They also had a bacteria. So they may have been responding to that, right? And this is why the stuff about using a Z pack and stuff, people were talking about that, but it probably makes absolutely no difference, right? Um, now, when you do have ARDS, which is that more sudden severe stuff, that seems to hit around days four to seven. And if that hits somebody, then that is more serious. That is the kind of thing I want people in the hospital for, okay? What can it lead to? It can lead to troubles with your lung function, into your brain, psychiatric, muscle deconditioning, and you can have people out of work for a while, right? So in that rare case, the more severe stuff, yes, this is more of a deal, right? More so than needs to be treated, which by the way, all the ICUs are getting much better at, right? Uh, at UCLA, where I have some relationship and some other places, you know, now it's it's, almost unheard of that somebody passes away, except for maybe the 95-year-old nursing home patient because the treatments have already gotten better than even before, right? So those, those mortality rates are dropping like flies, right? Uh, but remember, 65% of people are back to the usual health in about seven days. Um, and then the 85% severe persistent symptoms can be for 60 days, okay? So very few people get the long-term troubles, but if you get it, okay, then no question. Like every other bad flu that we've seen, like anybody who's ever had pneumonia, what I always say to my regular patients is, look, you got pneumonia, you got a plan that's gonna take two months to get better. They say, well, wait, wait, I don't understand. I don't have a fever, right? I am i don't have a cough anymore. I uh, uh, i don't have any chest pain. Why? 
Why am I still feeling this way? This is just how the body heals. This is just how long it takes, right? So here's some CT scans. This is the arrows pointing at what coronavirus looks like and uh, another rest stop for you. Okay, so now we're gonna go to testing. You guys had a lot of questions on testing, so please get ready. Please stay with me on this because testing is very important, okay? First question in testing, what type of test are you talking about? There is the nasopharyngeal swab that looks for the live virus antigen, okay? And there are different ways of doing this. So people have heard of PCR. There's also LAMP, NAT, FIA. Now, what I want you to keep in mind is the following things. Um, first of all, the nasal pharyngeal swab is, I think, still the best. That's the one that goes through the nose. The yes. They have ones where you wipe it in your mouth. They have ones where they'll put some in the back of the throat, and it's reasonable. But I still think nasal pharyngeal is the best. Two, the PCR is the gold standard, right? And what happens when you don't use the gold standard, when you do these quick testing ones, you can sometimes get false results, right? So it's a reasonable test to do the quick ones. I, I do use it. It can be informative, but it requires interpretation. Every test done in medicine requires an interpretation, which means you have to have a doctor. You have to talk to your doctor. You have to work with your doctor in order to know, is this the right thing to do? Is this what I should be testing? Does this result mean anything? Now, you could get more virus by going down the bottom of your lungs, but that requires all kinds of things that we're not gonna do. Um, and remember, the virus can shed, but not be infectious. Remember, we talked about that. I'm trying to drive that home about this testing, right? So remember that, right? Also remember what we said, the virus sheds 24 48 hours before symptoms, peaks about one day after symptoms. And so you can see, how that testing needs to be interpreted. Where are you in the time frame? Finding virus does not mean infection. Two studies were not able to culture after seven, eight days. That's why I said you're probably good up to about six days, right? After that, the virus is usually gone by 10 days, the fear 10 to 20 days, but you may not be transmitting, right? Which means by six days, you know, you want to make it a week, you know, yes, could you recover it? Sure, you could, okay? So all these tests require interpretation. Now I'm going to show you something. You're gonna say, oh my God, what, what's he doing wrong? I'm getting dizzy with these things, right? So just stay with me on this stuff. What this is, is this is showing you the probabilities of when you would do tests and where you are since your days of exposure, right? And so it tells you that depending on where you are on your test, the test varies on how reliable it's gonna be, how probable it is, right? Here's another way of looking at it, right? And it says, look, depending on how likely you are, it aids in the interpretation of the test, which means every test requires an interpretation. Every test requires a doctor to be looking at it, to knowing your symptoms, your history, your time frame, and then making a judgment about, do I believe the test? Is this the right time to test? What will this test mean for this individual, right? It's very important that you have that information, that dialogue going, okay? Now, blood tests, right? All of what we just talked about now, was the nasal just looking for the live virus, looking for the antigens, right? Now we're talking about the other tests. When people say I got tested, which test did you have? Did you have the virus test, the antigen test, or did you have the antibody test, right? The blood test, right? This looks for the antibodies that we produce, right? And there are different types of antibodies. The IgM lasts four to six days, peaks around day 12, and declines at the IgG, 10 to 18 days, which is why, by the way, which is why, which is I wanna get the antibody test, right? You gotta wait. If you think that you're really exposed, you gotta wait. You gotta wait. I usually tell my patients at least two, three weeks is preferable, right? To see if you've started to develop the antibodies, right? Now look, people say, well, Mark, I heard that you can get this thing again and the antibodies, you don't know what it means. Look, anything is possible, okay? Anything's possible, right? Let's talk about medical reality, right? What we know from the original SARS outbreak that the IgG peaked around three weeks and lasted for at least two years. The MERS outbreak lasted at least three years, right? And right now, we don't see any reason why this is gonna change a lot with this current coronavirus, right? Yes, there are people that do not get high antibody levels. People in particular who are not symptomatic don't seem to get high antibodies. Yes, you can have some people that drop off those levels after a shorter period of time than years, right? But first of all, we already know that there's durability now verified for at least eight months and it's ongoing, right? And these antibodies do work, right? Number two, 
there's other reasons why it's not to worry. Okay, so let me just show you this little uh, graph, which looks at the persistence of the antibodies over time, which is one of the studies that we use to say, okay, look, yes, there could be a little bit of drop off, but it can still be quite helpful, right? Next, the blood test, there are two, right? There's the lateral flow assay. This is like a pinprick test. And it's a reasonable test, right? But the best test, the one you want to get, is the ELISA test, right? It has a sensitivity and specificity which are very high. It's an excellent test. And you're going to know what it means, right? That's the test that you want. If you want to see if you have the antibodies, that's the one that you're going to go after. Now, this gets a little busy. I just want to show it to you because I want to drill home on something again. This is why all tests require interpretation. If you're in a flu season and you're checking for flu, then you have a high pre-test probability of flu. So when you do the test, your post-test probability is higher. It's a mathematical formula. Whereas if you're not in flu season and you do the test and you get a positive result, it's still much less probable, right? Which means if you get a positive test, it could be a false positive test if there's a low likelihood of having something. Therefore, every test requires interpretation. It depends on you. It depends on your exposure. It depends on your history. It depends on your health. And then we interpret those things to understand what it means. Now, you're going to say, oh my God, I can't believe it's going to show this to me because I haven't seen this since like high school or college, okay? So this is part of the uh, schematic of the immune system, but I want to drill it home to you. It's very important concepts here. Please stay with me. Say, say that, say that, look. Look, here comes the antigen. It comes in the macrophages, and it stimulates the T cells. T cells make other T cells, makes B cells. These cells make different types of B cells and the antibodies. So what you're seeing is that the immune system has more than one way to respond. It's not just antibodies. There's other cells. By the way, that's why they call it. They call it cellular immunity and humoral immunity because the humors, the antibodies, is only one mechanism. That's why, by the way, you can have situations where people say, well, didn't get an antibody, but they never get sick again. Why? Because they have the cell immunities, right? That's why, by the way, you know, some people say, well, that guy got exposed, but he never got sick. Well, this guy may have already had exposure to coronavirus from the common colds I told you about before. And then for this person, there was enough overlap, and enough recognition in the immune system that they didn't respond, right? So that's something else that could be operating. Look at this. Look, look, look. Stay with me. Very important study, right? This is a study with mild disease that they tested. In mild disease, when you do a very careful testing, 100% had T cell response and 100% had the IgG antibody response. 100%. In other words, when you do very careful testing, right? Not just, you know, in general labs, but when you're doing very careful scientific studies, right, where you're doing, spe uh, spending extreme resources on individual patients, you can see what the outcome is. You can see that they all respond. Now, look, look, look. This you're not going to believe, but stay with me. It's very important, very important, right? Patients who never had exposure to COVID-19, 50% of them show T cell activity. What does that mean? So this pla place that does this study has blood from prior studies. So they took some of their samples from 2015 to 2018 before COVID-19 ever existed. It wasn't in existence. And they test them and 50% showed cellular immunity. You say, how's that possible? It's possible because they already had exposure to the other coronaviruses. We all have had exposure to those viruses. That's why some people don't get sick. That's why a lot of people get better quickly because we already have seen this before, right? And we even have examples now in the literature of patients with congenital condition. Uh, I'll tell it to you once you can forget the name of it, called agamic albuminemia, which means they don't make antibodies and they get COVID-19 and they recover just fine because of the other types of immunity, right? Okay, now here's a schematic. This can be another way of looking at this. So I want you to just think about this. Here we go, here we go. On the left-hand side, we get exposed at some point, right? So here we go. We get the exposure, and all of a sudden, it starts replicating in us, right? So all of a sudden, if you were able to know somebody is about to get sick, and you tested them, you would see live virus. You would see some evidence that they're developing that viral thing, and then all of a sudden, they get their symptoms, right? But quickly, within days, that viral load starts dropping off, right? And we've already talked about that you get to that second week for sure, and these things are there, but they're probably not shedding or not live, but for certain, 
uh, they're dropping off fats. And what you do see, what you do see um, is that uh, the antibodies start showing up and that's how you know that they're there and that you're gonna be uh, protected, right? Okay, another way to look at it. Immunity probably happens by days seven to 10, right? Which is why they said, look, if you get about six days or so, then what's gonna happen is you start getting those T cells, those B cells, the antibodies, right? They all come into play now, right? Right after your exposure, that's what's gonna protect you, okay? So on testing, again, guaranteeing the following about the fatality rates, right? Huge numbers had and did not know it, um, probably at least 40, 45%. Huge numbers declined testing was available, they don't want to get tested, but the maximum fatality in the young is 0.02%, um, in under 70 is 0.04%. By the way, remember I told you, influenza is 0.1%, right? It's 0.1, right? Uh, heart disease, 17%. Cancer for percent You are more likely to die from accidents, pneumonia, suicide, overdose, motor vehicles, falls, guns, motorcycle, than any of this stuff, right? I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying it's a real infection. I'm not saying we don't have to pay attention to it. What I'm saying is you never hear this stuff about how rare it is to cause trouble and how much more so you are already exposed to other things that are more, more likely to cause fatalities and difficulties, right? Okay, rest up. All right. Now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some um, uh, treatment things that you may have heard about. Uh, so we can just go through that. Again, not the heavy inpatient stuff, just the little things that I think are very helpful for my patients that I've told them over time, they appreciate. Okay, first of all, uh, there are good overviews of this from the NIH and ACOM. Uh, the ACOM paper is the one we wrote. Uh, but first of all, anti-inflammatories. Uh, this is anecdotal reporting, but I wanna tell you something. If you are ever sick, with any kind of cold or flu, and you need to take something, take Tylenol. Why? Because Tylenol is better for your stomach, generally better for your liver, um, and doesn't have some of the clotting impacts. The anti-inflammatories are fine, right? So Aleve, Motrin, those kind of things are fine. But if you take high doses of either of these medicines, it can suppress your immune system, right? So try to use the minimum amount you need. Okay, next. There's a lot of discussion in the literature about blood pressure medicines making you more likely to have it. That was not confirmed in multiple studies. Next, I've already told you sunlight inactivates the virus. That's why I tell all patients, get outside, get outside, get outside. Next, I told you about the macrolides like ZPAP. Why it doesn't help, right? Next, vitamin D could theoretically help you, right? There's a lot of studies on that. Um, and so what I have, I always check my patients at their annual checkups for the vitamin D level. So you should always check your vitamin D level. And if you're running um, low, less than 30, then take some vitamin D supplementation. That will theoretically help you fight the virus. Uh, it will help you uh, in your uh, general health. And that's something I do recommend to people, okay? All right, that's a little rest stop. Okay, next, prevention, masks, all right? So there's a lot of talk about masks, appropriately so. So I wanna go through this with you uh, because there are some things that we have to cover, okay? If you're wearing a simple face covering, not a general surgery mask, you're trying not to give an infection. If you're wearing a high quality mask, you're trying not to get an infection. Um, people always say, what's the best ones? Uh, kind of the best ones I've seen are the ones made in Israel, Argamon and Synovia. Um, they put copper in there. Remember I told you before, we are talking about fomites and how quickly they drop off on copper surfaces. So this company said, hey, let's put some copper in these masks, it'll help even further. And there's even these copper fit products and which have an additional advantage. So if you're looking for one type, right? Uh, so that can be helpful, right? If you're a mirror mask, you are more likely to have asymptomatic diseases, which means if you're wearing a mask and you were to pick up this infection, because you didn't get a big viral load, you'll probably have less symptoms and actually recover quicker, right? Uh, you'll certainly decrease your chance of getting an infection, right? And a surgical mask can decrease the viral load to the wearer up to 83%, right? And it also decreases 70% going out to somebody. Okay? Cloth masks can decrease viral load to the wearer, but 75%, so not quite as good. Face shields. Face shields also protect the eyes. And one study showed that people who have eyeglasses were less likely to get infected because the virus could actually go on the mucous membranes of your eye and potentially cause an infection there. So again, mask wearing does have some data for it and some benefit for it, right? However, uh, the certainty of evidence in the science of masks is low right? So people are shocked by this, but this is straight out of our main, main medical research, our main medical research, right? Um, 
that the evidence, the science behind mask wearing is low quality evidence, right? You say, well, how is that possible? You just told me that this decreased, that decreased. Well, part of that is, is because some of those, some studies, but look at this list of reasons, right? Some of the biggest things there, people don't wear them, don't wear them consistently, are not also doing their hands, are not socially distancing, um, they're not fitted to the face, or you know, some of the studies on masks were generated in the medical environment with very special masks, as opposed to the ones that people generally use. So the masks are not all certain, 100%, here, here. it helps, it's reasonable, but it's not the kind of thing that you should think like, oh my God, that person's not wearing a mask, it's the worst thing in the world, right? You know, I mean, there are places where it's appropriate and there are places where it's not necessary, right? Uh, this is a slide that looks at how good they filter things. By the way, by the way, look at this, look, look, look. People sometimes take a fleece and they'll put it up on like a turtleneck like around their mouth. That actually makes no difference at all, right? Bandanas are way better, right? And then you can see as you go up to the different styles here of things that work, how well they work, right? But it's way up here that you get the surgical medical world of where we need that kind of um, protection because of the environments that we're in, right? Here's another slide, a little busy, but please, please, please stay with me on this. Very important, very important slide, right? This summarizes the literature. Look, 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 look. If you're walking outside alone, you do not need a mask. If you're walking with somebody that you live with, you don't need a mask, right? Now, if you say to me, well, Mark, what about going into stores or something? Okay. Now I'm saying, all right, look, it's probably reasonable that if you want to wear a mask, um, it's okay. But especially if it's a small store, if there's a lot of people in the store, okay, then it's reasonable, right? But you can see right here, it's kind of the literature is neutral on this kind of stuff, right? It's only when you get up to the medical world, our world of ambulatory care, hospital wards, of, that there's good data that says, okay, in these environments, despite our best efforts, because there's so much frequent contact, because the patients aren't moving, because we're all in the rooms together for a long period of time, then we have to have greater protection, right? That's one way to look at it. Here's another way, right? One more slide on this stuff. I know it's a little bit busy, but stay with me, stay with me, right? If you're in a low occupancy world versus high occupancy world, if the outdoors and well ventilated versus poorly ventilated, then you can start to see what happens as you go up that scale, right? So for a lot of environments, you don't need a mask, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't wear a mask. I'm not saying that there's not a benefit of that. I'm saying that there's literature that you have to be honest about, that it probably makes no difference whatsoever, right? In those very select environments, just like, just like when you're in those very select environments where it's a small room, poorly ventilated, a lot of people, okay, that's the red zones over here. That's the one you should have a mask, right? Okay, vaccines. Everybody's talking about the vaccine. So I thought I'd just do this for you guys real quickly. Um, uh, again, a lot of issues here. Um, I just thought I'd show you some data. Uh, one in about 93% of vaccines never make it to market. Uh, usually we have to spend billions on it to get there. It usually takes five to 10 years. Uh, this is one of the good things about uh, President Trump's Operation Warp Speed. It's incredible what they've turned around and been able to do in such a short period of time. Never seen this before in the history of medicine. Really impressive. Uh, but of course, you don't get something for nothing, right? You don't know for sure in the long run, what these long-term complications are. Now in our medical journals, they're pounding us. It's gonna be safe, it's gonna be safe, it's gonna be safe. And they're probably right, probably will be safe. But this is a whole new world, right? These vaccines, right? The Modernas, right? The Pfizer's, right? They're using mRNA technology. See this mRNA? That's a new type of technology. That's why they're able to get it through so quickly. So it's a new type of technology and it's probably fine. Now, what do I say to my patients? For my patients that are 80, 90, frail, I'm saying, look, then almost certainly you should take it. And they'd certainly be one of the groups that would be the first to be identified. What about somebody who's 20, 30, otherwise healthy? Should they take the vaccine? Maybe. First of all, you won't be in first line anyway, so it'll pay, take a while to get to you to make that decision. And secondly, you know, over time, we have to see how it behaves in the real population, okay? Um, next. Uh, there's some stuff that came out in your stuff about travel. So I just thought I'd hit this real quick. Um, overall, the airports, airplanes, probably the safest they've ever been. They use highly recycled air. Uh, CDC suggests 14 days if you're exposed to a high-risk area, but you can probably drop that now. 
Uh, and really, there's only been about 40 cases ever documented out of hundreds of thousands, approaching millions of air travelers uh, to have picked up Corona. And it's hard to know, was it the cab, cab ride, was the airport, was the airplane? But overall, uh, for the most part, it's not the airplanes. They are safe, uh, uh, reasonable to do. Okay, rest stop. Okay, now we're going to what I hope is the last section. What I thought I would do with you is your work overlaps very much like with a school type environment. So what I thought I'd do is I'd show you some of the data from the school, an area that I spent a lot of time in because it's quite applicable. You know, you're talking about the same types of population, younger folks, right? Teens, maybe 20s, uh, but you know, usually the teens and obviously one of the young groups, not, not maybe as applicable to you, uh, but nonetheless overlaps quite a bit, right? So schools, why in the world do you want to keep those places open, right? Every study shows that when you have in-person instruction, it helps. And you people know better than me that when you're with that environment, with the groups, with the mental health counseling, with the one-on-ones, all of that stuff makes a huge difference in people's outcomes, right? Um, I'm not gonna discuss colleges, that's a different model, but in the ideal college model, which is totally different with you know, all that group, they have to test them over th every three days if they really wanna make an impact, so not, not after us. Who says that we should always have these people open? Everybody, okay? Virtually every doctor you ever speak to says we should be open, right? We should not be shutting down our economy and we should not be shutting down our schools, right? Lots of people say that, right? Um, what are the risks if you got kids there, right? Um, it's very low, right? Why? Uh, multiple reasons, right? Um, the kids uh, and young adults have very low risk of anything significant or severe, um, and that's the good news, right? Um, so they're a very low risk group to have them in. Um, and that's why we like to do it. Um, they are rarely the primary source of infection. We're waiting for some other studies on that. The risk rises once you get to high school, but still very low, about uh, you know 2% of all kids. LA County, as an example, they had about 14, maybe it's up to 15,000 now. Uh, I'd have to check it. About 1,000 hospitalizations per corona, no deaths, right? I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying it's not a real infection. I'm not saying we don't have to work on it. I'm just saying that the things we really worry about have to be balanced against the needs of these individuals to get the care they need, the treatment they need, and, and what is going on for them and what is the risk to them, okay? Uh, what's the risk of kids not to come back to school, not to be in programs? Depression goes way up, sedentary behavior goes up, stress weakens the immune system, and you know when, when our little darlings and teenagers are not in our programs, they're not just sitting around being little angels, right? So being in structures, being in environments where they're helped, that is gonna help them a lot, okay? Um, next, um, what are the risks to teachers? What are the risks to some of the people that are treating these folks, right? Well, look, 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 look. If you have a community penetration of less than 5%, you probably don't even need masks, right? I'm not saying don't wear a mask. I'm not saying you don't have to have a mask, right? What I'm saying is, is the literature says that in very, carefully designed studies, as long as the teacher's up there and not slobbering over a kid and, and right next to them and you know talking to them one foot away and nobody's got a mask or something like that. Okay, if you're doing something where you're leading groups or you're at some distance or something, you got a window open room, you got a door open room, whatever it is, you know, your risks are very remote. And if you start throwing in distancing, start throwing masks, yeah, mask, you've got almost uh, nothing to really worry about, right? Um, where has this been tried, right? Everywhere right? And in these situations, uh, they did one study where they looked at 50,000 child care workers in the United States, and there was no increased risk of infection. 50,000 child care workers, people working with teens and kids who are, and, and you know, kids, they can be even harder to kind of manage, but the teens, um, you know, at least, you know, you can communicate a little bit better with them. And even in these studies, 50,000, not an increased risk of infection, right? Um, uh, and Georgia uh, had issues. Um, they were, uh, uh, they came out South Korea, had some intermittent closures. There will be some infections. Kids do secrete virus. You can handle it responsibly knowing how simple that can be. Okay, so remember, um, age, uh, less than 70, the fatality rate is 0.04%. You're more like diaphragmosis, 65% are back to normal. 
counts can be misleading uh, because of the way they do some of the counting here. Risk of being in the hospital is extremely rare. Risk of dying, if you're over 65, is about the same as the flu. Uh, international fatality rates that they'll sometimes talk about do COVID crunches. If you do your work, you're healthy. If you've not worked, your health indicators get worse. So what do I always tell people? Diet, exercise, keep your weight. See your doctor regularly. Get a flu shot every fall. Who should get a vaccine? That's going to be something we have to talk about. We talked about the math. We talked about the face shields, right? And like everything else, uh, prayer is very important. It always can be helpful for you. And so that's what I, I want to uh, talk to you about, about uh, this whole area of the coronavirus and what it means. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to go through, take questions. Um, uh, so if you want to ask a question, you can unmute. I'm also going to go through the list, try to help everyone.